Let's revise Jung's double slit experiment in physics. This video is suitable for all exam boards. This story actually starts with Isaac Newton, who originally thought that light was a particle. On the other hand, Huygens thought that light was indeed a wave similar to a water wave. The experiment that we have here actually proved that light had wave-like nature. And if you study quantum physics later on, you're going to see how light has particle nature as well. So how did Thomas Jung actually show the wave nature of light? Well, we have a lamp across here and that releases some light. That light is gonna go through a filter. This ensures that we have a monochromatic source of light. Remember, a monochromatic source simply means that it's composed of a light of a single wavelength. The light waves reach the first slit right across here where they will diffract. And we can see the spreading of the wave across here. So this here is an example of diffraction. The diffracted waves will then encounter two further slits, which I've named S1 and S2. Those individual slits will diffract the light yet again and will serve as two separate sources. If a peak meets another peak, then we're gonna get some constructive interference, which will essentially be a bright spot. And if a peak meets a trough, then all the light will cancel. So we're gonna get these series of uh, essentially maxima and minima in our interference pattern. That's kind of going to look like this. Now this is a pure wave-like behavior and we've explained the exact mechanism in my superposition video which is also part of this playlist. But this conclusively proved that light had wave-like properties and uh, it is one more tick essentially for the wave nature of the light. In fact, here's a video of two ducks that I filmed while I was walking of essentially the same phenomena. I suggest that we call that Jung's double duck experiment. The equation that we're going to use to describe this experiment is the famous lambda is equal to ax divided by d equation. In this case lambda is the wavelength and typically measured in meters. That's the wavelength of the source of light. A is our slit separation, which is typically taken center to center. So this distance here is A. And X is our fringe separation. So let me just zoom in. X is the distance from a bright fringe to a bright fringe. So this here is X. Or it could equally be the distance from a dark fringe to, a, to the center of a dark fringe. So because they're going to be identical. D, on the other hand, is the distance from the slits or the line of the slits to the line of the screen, which is this distance across here. So this is D. Just a little note that if you're doing AQA, the equation would typically be written in terms of the fringe separation. And rather than X, AQA likes to call that W. And the equation is typically given rearranged for W. So W will be given by lambda D multiplied by s. Now in AQA's variant of uh, writing this equation, w is just a fringe separation or the fringe spacing. We can leave it as that. Lambda is the wavelength yet again. And the uh, slit separation is s. So we can write the slit distance or slit separation. And D is, once again, the distance to the screen. So distance to the screen. In the OCR, and I believe in other exam boards too, lambda is just the wavelength. A is our slit separation, or slit distance. Uh, I've written distance down into the other formula, so I'm gonna, just going to write distance as well. So slit distance and x is our fringe separation fringe separation and d is exactly the same 
So where does this equation actually come from? It comes first of all from the limit that the distance to the screen D needs to be significantly bigger than the slit separation, which is A. Now, let's imagine that we have a point, let's say that point X is a maxima, and let's say that point Y is a minima or a dark spot, whereas X is a very bright spot. So let's trace a ray. First of all, we're gonna have a ray of light coming out of S1 that's gonna reach the bright spot. Now, if the same ray is emerging out of, let's say, S2, it's gonna have a slightly smaller path such as this let's try and draw that quite carefully with my digital ruler so it's gonna look something like this now how could we draw the path difference in the limit that D is significantly larger than the slit separation the path difference will just simply be given by the following so the two rays if we had a 90 degree triangle across here so let's see if i can draw that quite carefully then the distance here um, is going to be our path difference so i'm just going to call that p and i'm going to call this angle here theta one remember this is only allowed if the distance d is significantly larger than a why is that well because that's only when the path difference is going to be given by this length across here well because if i had some double slits then if d is significantly larger than a then those two lines would be essentially parallel to one another but let's remain focused on this triangle that i am just highlighting across here so the sine of this angle so sine of theta 1 is going to equal to the opposite which is the path difference p divided by the hypotenuse because this angle was about 90 then our hypotenuse will just be the slit separation which is a however look at this we're talking about x which a, which is a maxima which means that p will have to be equal to the wavelength assuming of course that uh, this is actually the first order of the interference pattern so in this case we can write down that sine of theta 1 will be equal to the wavelength divided by the slit separation however remember that d is significantly larger than a so this means that we can take our small angle approximation we can see say that sine of theta is about equal to theta itself when they're in radians so we can directly write that theta 1 is equal to lambda over a okay so next I want you guys to consider another triangle this triangle here in blue shall we just highlight that in blue like so the is actually similar to the one which I have highlighted just before and we've expressed this relationship now why are the two triangles similar first of all ooh, what happened to this let's try again so let's be a little bit better at highlighting okay so this side D here is the same for both triangles the P which stands for path difference in this triangle is going to be exactly the same as the distance from X to Y because that's the distance from a maxima to a minima ie y one wavelength so in a way this side here is a wavelength and then this side here is going to be a wavelength as well the angle here is 90 degrees the angle here is 90 degrees so the two triangles are actually similar so this means that this angle here is also exactly the same so we can call this angle theta theta one as well well i'm going to call it theta two i'm going to say that theta one is the same as theta two by similar triangles now 
So let's consider the tangent of this angle. So tan of theta 2 will just be equal to the opposite, which is x. In this case, that's also equal to lambda in this geometry, but x is the fringe separation. So let's just write down that this is also equal to x and divided by the adjacent, which is just this distance d. So with the small angle approximation, we can also say that sine is approximately equal to theta, but also that tan of theta is approximately equal to theta as well. Therefore, we can write that theta 2 will be x over d. But hang on a minute, theta 1 is the same as theta 2 by similar triangles, therefore we can combine those two equations and we can write down that this is going to equal to this, i.e. lambda over a will be equal to x over d. And if you are doing AQA, the proof is exactly the same, the only difference is what you call the symbols, so the fringe separation will just be w and the slit separation is just called s. And let's have a look at an experiment to determine the wavelength of light using a double slit. In terms of our measurements, we're going to be using exactly the same setup that we've been talking about throughout this video. We're going to measure the distance to the screen D and the fringe separation X with a ruler. Just a little note that the slit separation, if you're doing um, this experiment in the lab, will typically be written down on the equipment itself. However, if we're doing a six marker question, we can write down that this can be measured with a traveling microscope. As in all experiments, we're going to vary something. In this case, we could measure the, we could vary the distance D to the screen by moving either the slits or the screen. We're going to measure how this affects the fringe separation X. In practice, we're going to have a table of results, which is going to include X and D. And afterwards, we're going to plot a graph of X against D. Now, the graph will be a straight line through the origin. Why would that be? Well, remember, the equation that we proved a moment ago was that lambda is equal to a times x divided by d. So let's rearrange for what's on the y-axis. And uh, this is, of course, x. So we can say that x will be equal to lambda d divided by a. Now, if we compare this to y is equal to mx plus c, if the fringe separation is on the y-axis, if the distance to the screen is on the x-axis, we should have an intercept of zero. And what's left for our gradient m is the wavelength divided by the slit separation. So we can say that our gradient m is going to be equal to lambda divided by a, i.e. the wavelength lambda will be equal to the gradient multiplied by the slit separation. In practice, if we were to do this in a question in the lab, we'll also ensure that we take a large gradient to minimize the percentage uncertainty. Now, how can we reduce the errors in this experiment? First of all, we're going to ensure that our distance d is increased to a maximum which will reduce percentage uncertainty. Remember, your percentage uncertainty is equal to the absolute uncertainty divided by the value times 100. So if the value goes up, the percentage uncertainty will go down. Additionally, we're going to measure the distance between multiple fringes and then divide by that number. What do I mean by that? Well, if we were to just go back to this diagram here, rather than measure each of those individual values of x, which is kind of a tiny distance, I could measure this distance here, which involves one, two, three, four of them. So let's say if I measured this to be 10 centimeters, then x will then be just equal to 10 divided by four, which is 2.5 centimeters. And this will ensure that this reduces my percentage uncertainty by taking the larger measurement. Finally, I would like to go for a couple of really common problems. So very often we would get asked in an exam a question such as stay the effect on the fringes if the distance to the screen is increased. Now this is all about this 
formula. So lambda is equal to AX over D. The effect on the fringes is essentially our fringe separation. So I'm just going to rearrange for X once again, which is equal to lambda D divided by A. Now, if the distance to the screen is increased, then the fringe separation will also increase only provided that everything else is constant. So we can write this down. And here is our answer that the fringe separation x increases in this case as is directly proportional to the distance d provided that the wavelength and the slit separation a remain constant. Okay, right, I've missed a little comma here. Let's add that. This could also appear in various different formats. For instance, they may ask you what will happen to the fringe separation if the distance d is constant, but in this case we use light of, let's say, shorter wavelength. Well, if we use light of shorter wavelength and everything else remains constant, then x will go down. And we need to answer this in exactly the same way as this question, that the fringe separation will decrease as is directly proportional to the wavelength, provided that d and a remain constant. Another question that appears fairly often is being asked what would happen if you were to swap the sources. This is typically asked on the double slit for sound, which you just made with a couple of speakers that act as the slits, as the sources of waves. What will happen if you swap them? If that's the case, the maxima would turn into minima and vice versa. Finally, also just a little note that occasionally we can get asked for this experiment for sound and the procedure is exactly the same with the exception of these differences. We're going to measure the distance D from a couple of speakers that are going to act like two slits to a microphone with a ruler. So that's going to be just this horizontal distance here. We're going to call that D. And the slit separation in this case will just be the distance between the individual speakers. So this here will just be A. Now X will be the distance between the maxima and we're going to see if there's a maxima by moving this microphone along a line. So we'll just draw that line along a vertical line across here. And every time we reach a maximum, we'll be able to see that the oscilloscope will be showing us a maximum amplitude. This is our maxima. As soon as we reach a minima, let's say here, then the oscilloscope will give us a minima, which will be pretty close to a flat line. Let's just draw a flat line across here. Afterwards, we're going to follow exactly the same procedure. We're going to uh, vary the distance, for instance, d. We're going to measure the fringe separation x. We're going to plot a graph of x against d, for instance. We're going to follow the exactly same procedure to find the gradient as we did for the um, for the light experiment. Okay, folks, well, I'm hoping that this video was useful. If you're revising this, you definitely need to have a look at my video on superposition, which is incredibly connected to this topic. And this video is right over here. Good luck with your revision. You've got this.